in, he's taught them, he's trained them, he's prayed for them, he's prepared them, disciplined them, protected them, and all of that time, all of that work, all of that energy is now culminating on this hillside as our Lord is about to ascend to the right hand of the Father to take his rightful and prophesied place as the sovereign. I want to quickly say for you new folks at Buck Creek, I'm going to let you in on something. If you want to be in good standing with Pastor Kenny, you better memorize this passage. Uh, I'm his son-in-law, and I can remember asking him if I could marry Amy, and the very next thing out of his mouth is, can you recite Matthew 28, 18 through 20? It's a big, big deal. This is like the staple passage of Buck Creek Church, and it's a good one. So here we go. These were Jesus' last words to his followers. The text says, And Jesus came up and he spoke to them saying, All power and all authority, both in heaven and on earth, everyone say, and on earth, has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, before we rip this apart and we get into the nuts and the bolts of what this passage means, how many know that we live in a day and time where now more than ever we need to be very clear in our terms and in our definitions? It, uh, it still throws me for a loop. It wasn't too long ago that Matt Walsh, who is a contributor for the Daily Wire, basically went viral and blew up, um, caused all sorts of outrage and discussion and debate. He was on Dr. Phil. I mean, it was, it was nuts. And the only thing that he asked was this question. Y'all remember what it was? What is a woman? Many of those on the hard left today, they're not only interested in redefining terms, but they're wanting to all out eliminate them. Mother's Day was a few weeks back, and and I can remember just kind of scrolling through social media and just being shocked and amazed at how often I was seeing these Facebook fights break out Because there's actually people now advocating that men, biological males, can conceive and now birth children. And so they were advocating that we stop using the term Mother's Day and start using the the term birthing people's day. I wish I was making that up. Sadly, a lot of this confusion... And this redefining of terms has crept its way into the church. So as a word of caution, Christians, let me say that when you listen to podcasts and sermons and when you read books and attend conferences, you need to be very careful in how you take certain words and certain terms and definitions. You need to do your due diligence and study to show yourself approved as the scriptures teach us. We need to be Bereans again, amen? And it's with that thought in mind that I want to break this passage down into four sections. And I want to briefly elaborate on what it truly is that Jesus our King has commissioned you and I to do in the Great Commission passage. And the first thing that I want you to see is this powerful and sovereign proclamation Now remember, when Jesus said this, it was at the height of the Roman Empire, where Caesar was not only viewed as a ruler, but as a god. Caesar was recognized and even worshipped as having all power, all authority, and being worthy of all glory. More on that in a moment. So what Jesus says here was extremely controversial It was extremely blasphemous in the eyes of Rome, and it was extremely treasonous to their government. Understand that. And make no mistake about it, friends, when Jesus made this proclamation, it was 100% political, and it was 100% intentional. How many of you enjoy reading about history or watching uh, historical documentaries? Has anyone ever taken the time to study the Roman Empire from just a completely secular or just a purely historical source? um, It really is fascinating to see how Rome governed back then. And um, I just love going and seeing, 
you know, what, what was going on in, uh, in Rome at the time in, in the back of your mind knowing, oh man, that's probably when Paul was taking his journey through Ephesus or going here or going there. This is probably where Jesus was saying this or teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's fascinating if you've never done that. And I can remember a few years back as I was studying this for the very first time and coming to the realization that the first century Christians were not killed because they worshipped Yahweh. They were not killed because they worshipped the God of the Bible. The Jews worshipped Yahweh. And they conspired with Rome to kill Jesus. They got along just fine. The first century Christians were not even killed because they worshipped the troublemaker Jesus himself. Rome was a pagan nation. You could worship whoever you wanted and however you wanted. There were literally hundreds, possibly even thousands of gods in Rome. They didn't care. So long as you were willing to honor Caesar as the sovereign over them all. A little Roman history here. Julius Caesar died in 44 B.C. And two years later in 42 B.C., his successor, Caesar Augustus, deified him. He pronounced that he is now a god. And he did this because a comet was seen flying overhead at the funeral games that had been set up in Julius Caesar's honor. So Rome literally believed that through the dynasty of the Caesars was embodied the Roman god, Jupiter. And they demanded that the Caesars be worshipped by placing a little pinch of incense on a fire that burned by his statue. They didn't care if you followed Jesus. You want to worship Jesus as king? Fine. You want to say with your mouth that he's the Lord of lords? Fine. Call him king. Call him Lord. Sing your songs. Pray your prayers. But at the end of the day, just come back and offer a little pinch to Caesar, and we're good. That was how it worked. Our first century brothers and sisters were not martyred for merely saying or thinking that that Jesus was sovereign. They were thrown to the lions and burned at the stake because they lived like he was the sovereign. They were viewed as atheists and enemies of the state because they defied the tyrants who had set themselves higher than the triune God of the Bible. That's what got them killed. See, as modern evangelicals living in the comforts of America today, it's, it's easy for us to have a, a watered-down view of what Jesus meant when he said, all power and all authority are mine. For us, that statement has become a cool t-shirt or a pithy little coffee cup slogan. But for the first century Christians in Rome, it was a proclamation of death. To act as though Jesus truly had all power and all authority was to defy the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. And just to pull the curtain back a little bit into into the first century uh, Roman world, let me briefly introduce you to Emperor Nero who was just one of several tyrannical emperors that ruled during the time that the apostles were hitting the streets in the book of Acts. Nero reigned from 54 AD to 68 AD and is known as one of the most wicked and evil rulers the world has ever seen, even by Roman historians' accounts. He would make sport of Christians by wrapping them in the the skins of dead animals and having them mauled to death by packs of wild dogs. Another one of his favorite things to do was Christians was to nail them to crucifixes or posts, drench their bodies in oil, hoist them into the air, and light their bodies on fire to provide light for his evening dinner parties. He had his first wife decapitated, And he murdered his second wife by repeatedly kicking her in the stomach while she was pregnant with his child. 
This was a bad man. This was a powerful man. This was a dangerous man. And yet, it was under Nero's rule that we see the Apostle Peter in the streets publicly proclaiming about Jesus that there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, you've all heard that before. But what you may not know is that when Peter said that, at the time, written literally on the walls in Rome, literally imprinted, you can go buy coins today, you're going to pay a lot for it, but they're there, imprinted on Roman coins. It says there is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved than Caesar. So when Peter says this, it was very cheeky. It was very intentional. And it was a direct slap in the face to the Roman government. And this civil disobedience would ultimately cost Peter his life as Nero had him crucified. But as you'll remember, Peter requested to be crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to die in the same manner as my Lord Jesus. So you see, brothers and sisters, when Jesus told his followers to go tell the nations that all power and all authority are now his, it doesn't quite hit us the same way that it hit them back then. Jesus was literally calling them to sign their death warrants. And we're sitting here this morning on the other side of the world in padded pews, drinking flavored coffee in the air conditioner, Because they did it. So we have this sovereign proclamation from Jesus. All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. And now we get the second part of the Great Commission, which is the mission statement. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now remember what I said earlier. We need to be very clear in our terms and definitions, right? So if our mission from our king is to go make disciples, what do we need to know? What is a, y'all are paying attention. All right, guys, don't let Pastor Kenny down. Y'all know what's coming. What is the definition of a disciple? I'm going to help you out. A disciple of Jesus is someone who has been called, changed, and is on mission with Jesus. Part one of being disciple, being called by Jesus. Pretty straightforward, right? The effectual calling goes out when the gospel is proclaimed. You fall under conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit who enables you through the gift of faith and repentance to plead the name of his son and the blood that he shed on the cross to reconcile us back to God the Father so that on that day when you stand before the Lord of glory, your only hope in being found guiltless before him is by faith in Christ and grace alone. Amen? Romans 8.30 says, Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. So as disciples of Jesus, we are first called by Jesus. Part two of being a disciple of Jesus is being changed by Jesus. Now that may seem pretty straightforward too, but I want to hang out here for just a moment and point out that when you come to Christ, you have essentially died. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he wasn't speaking in code. When Christ picked up his cross, he carried it to his death. And that's exactly where he intends for us to end up when we pick up and carry our cross. The call to salvation is literally a call to come and die. But after that death, you're born again into the family of God. Living now as a man or a woman... Only one of those. Walking in newness of life as a new creation, not only in word, but in deed. You are no longer the master of your life, but rather you're a slave to the good master, King Jesus. And before you say yes and amen, let's break that down for just a moment to make sure you really get what I'm saying here. Kylie will tell you, Josh, where are you at? Josh has been out there with us. Three years of street ministry, I can tell you right now. 
There are people all over this state who say and believe that they've been born again because they can remember a time where they walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, and went through the bathtub. And yet they have no problem looking us dead in the eye on a busy street corner on a Friday night in Greenville and saying, I've got a pocket full of condoms and my goal is to have every one of them gone by in the morning. As Kylie and I stand on that ladder at 1142 Grove Road and we preach Christ over that fence, we try and ask those who are going in and coming out, ma'am, sir, would you consider yourself to be a Christian? You would be shocked at how many people say, yes, I am. Because I prayed a prayer when I was five years old. Now let me be clear. I am not, moms, put your rocks back in your pocket. I am not saying that God can't save kids at five years old. God can do that. God does do that. And if you have a five-year-old or a four-year-old who has professed with their mouth that Christ is Lord and they're bearing fruit in accordance with that profession, I believe it was genuine and I praise God for it. But what I am saying is that Scripture tells us clearly and often that if you are truly His, if you have truly been born into the family of God, then you now have the Holy Spirit of the triune God indwelling in you. And part of the Holy Spirit's job in the life of a believer is to mold, Tammy mentioned it earlier, to mold us and to chisel us and to shape us more and more and more as time goes on into the image of our Lord Jesus in our thoughts, words, and deeds. It's the, that's what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. And Philippians 1 6 tells us, says, You can be confident in this, that he that began a good work in you, speaking of the Holy Spirit, will complete it. As one who has been changed by Jesus, having died to your, formal, your former self, and now living as a slave to the high King of glory, you no longer get to have an opinion that is not guided or informed by the very king who bought you with his blood. The only authority in your life, y'all need to get this, the only authority in your life, the only opinion that now matters in your life, the only standard in your life is this right here. And like those first century believers in Rome, you will not compromise on it no matter the cost. God loves it. You should love it too. If God hates it, you should hate it too. And without shame. But this is not what the world will tell you Christianity is. The world... And sadly, many churches will tell you that you can use the word Christian as a tagline and put anything else you desire in front of it. I'm going to be very clear here. Calling yourself a gay Christian or a pro-choice Christian makes no more sense than calling yourself a pregnant man. It doesn't exist. Gay and pro-choice are diametrically opposed to the biblical definition of the word Christian. Gay Christian, pro-choice Christian, pregnant man. I'm going to go on ahead and say it because it needs to be said. Female pastor. There's the eyebrows. These are social constructs. It's that redefining of terms that I mentioned earlier. And church, we need to stop tolerating it. And we need to start calling it out when we see it. You say, well, I don't, 
If I don't call everyone by their desired pronouns, my company will fire me. Amen. Let them fire you. Listen to me. It's better to be a fired Christian than a hired coward. And why would you want to work for a company like that anyway? Your duty as one who has been called and changed by Jesus, listen to me, is to hold the line and the standard of the word of God, period. It costs Christians in Rome their very lives. So yeah, it may cost you your job. It may cost you relationships. It may cost you a little money. Y'all know what this is right here? Kylie knows. This is a lawsuit filed against me by an abortion clinic in the state of Tennessee. Your pastor, Kenny McDowell, many of you don't know this, he don't flaunt it. Was it nine days? Spent nine days in Greenville County Detention Center. Why? Standing outside of the abortion clinic. It may cost you a little pain and a little discomfort. Brothers and sisters, welcome to biblical Christianity. And if you read the prophets in the book of Acts, you'll find that you're in good company. I'm not trying to be overly blunt or harsh, but this is war, brothers and sisters. This isn't mere politics or civil disagreement. Do you understand? And if you don't believe me, look at what's going on in China. Look at what's going on in Europe and in Australia. Did you know that if the enemy in this world had their way, that you and I would be either imprisoned or killed, and your children would be hijacked by the state and made slaves? That's what's going on in places around the world right now for those who are professing Christ as king. How many knew that during COVID there were actually legislators advocating that if you refuse to get your child vaccinated, the state should come in and take them from you on the grounds of child neglect? Right here in the good old U.S. of A. We better wake up. Stay on track, Matt. A disciple's been called by Jesus, been changed by Jesus, and here's why I really want to camp out for a minute. A disciple of Jesus is on mission with Jesus. What is the mission? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey what God has commanded. If we're going to teach these nations to obey God's commands, what do we need to know? What has God commanded? Where do we find that? I'm glad you asked. Turn with me to Matthew twenty-two thirty-five. 35. Matthew chapter 22. Verses 35 through 40. It says, But when, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to what he says right here. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Notice here, Jesus does not do away with the law here. He encompasses it. He's basically saying, you want to know what the greatest commandment of all of them is? All of them. That's what he said. You say, well, wait a minute, Matt. Are you telling me that God's law is still in play in the New Testament, the New Covenant? I thought we were now under grace and not works. And I would submit to you that we have always been under grace and not works. Brothers and sisters, it was never the blood of bulls and goats that pleased our Lord. Psalm 51, 17. No one has ever been saved by keeping the law because no man besides Jesus has ever kept the law. 
it has always been only the grace of God that we were not thumped into oblivion after the fall. That's it. See, much like how we view the Great Commission through a modern American lens, we tend to do the same with the law of God. Contrary to what you might hear from a lot of celebrity pastors like Rick Warren and Stephen Furtick and Andy Stanley, let me go on ahead and be clear right here. No, Andy, you should not unhitch from the Old Testament. Christ said he didn't come to abolish the law, but rather he came to fulfill it. By fulfill, he meant bring it to its full meaning. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've heard it said that you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that if you even look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. Now think for a minute. Do we really believe that what Jesus was saying there in the Old Testament, it wasn't adultery as long as you looked and didn't touch? Is that really what we believe that Jesus was saying there? No. Jesus was bringing the full meaning of what it was always about, the heart of man. When Jesus came to fulfill the law, he didn't come to delete it. He came to put an exclamation point on it. The only way in the world that we have a clue about what is just and unjust and righteous and wicked and good and bad, brothers and sisters, the only place where we can find that is in the Old Testament, in the law of God. If Christ himself said the greatest two commandments are to love God and love your neighbor, how are we supposed to know what that looks like? We probably need to figure that out, wouldn't you think? That's what we've been commissioned to do. Go teach the nations. Teach them what? What I've commanded. What have you commanded? Go to the Old Testament and find out. It's like our how-to manual. And it's the only one that exists. So no, you shouldn't unhitch from the Old Testament. Scratch that junk. This is another sermon. Kenny, I'm inviting myself to come back to preach on this one day. I, I don't have time this morning to flesh out which laws apply today and which ones don't. Um, there's a great book out there written by a genius of a man, Dr. Greg Bonson. I would highly recommend this to you. It's called By This Standard. Probably one of the best works on the subject. But in a nutshell, because I don't want to leave you hanging or confused here, here's the general rule of thumb. Unless Christ explicitly satisfied a specific law, we should continue observing it. So can we eat shellfish and pork now? Praise God, somebody. Yes, we can. But why? Well, it's because the Scriptures have made it clear in the New Testament that we're no longer bound by the dietary laws. See what I'm saying? Christ satisfied those things. We also no longer observe the ceremonial and sacrificial laws. You don't have to wash your hands seven times in a bowl. The Catholics do, but we're not there. Before you come into the temple of God, you don't have to do all these crazy things. Why? Because we no longer sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats. Christ has come to be our ultimate and final sacrifice that would last throughout all of eternity. So those things are obsolete now. He satisfied those portions of the law. But what about the parts of the law dealing with morality, justice, penalties for crimes? Did Jesus satisfy those? No, he did not. And by me saying he didn't satisfy those, I mean he didn't make them obsolete. We are still bound to them. So what does that mean for us today? It means that if he is king of kings and lord of lords, and he is, and if our job is to go teach the nations what he has commanded, and it is, then part of the great commission is making sure that the nations know what God has decreed in his law regarding, or regardless of what you, I'm sorry, and live accordingly. 
And regardless of what you were taught growing up or what you may even think right now, the South Carolina State House and Washington, D.C. are not exempt from this mandate. Our laws and our policies from D.C. all the way down to your local house district precincts are bound by the law of God because it was God himself who established government. Why do we reject that two men can be joined in marriage? Why do we reject that two women cannot be joined in marriage? Because it was the God of the Bible who created marriage, who designed it, and who defined it. But guys, on that same coin, we should reject that the government gets to make laws apart from the law of God. Why? Because God created it. God created government. He established government. He, des he designed government. And he defined it. Is the state separate from the church? Yes. Those are two uh, distinctly different spheres of government that play different roles and carry out different responsibilities. But brothers and sisters, there is no separation between the state and God. He made it, he defined it, and he told them to obey his commands and his law. By a show of hands, who in here believes that capital punishment in certain circumstances is the right punishment for certain crimes? Let's say that a 30-year-old man rapes a 3-year-old girl. I know that's graphic, but I'm trying to take it to the worst possible place here. Who would say that the just, punish, the just punishment for that crime would be death? Hey, some amens on that one. Here's the more important question. What standard are you appealing to to make that claim? You ever thought about that? How do you know that you're right? Could you be wrong? Who made you the arbiter of what is just and what is unjust? Let me give you another one. Let's say that a mom drowns her 10-day-old baby in the bathtub because she feels like she made a mistake and she's convinced herself That if she doesn't get rid of this baby, she won't be able to finish school and accomplish her goals. How many of you would say that she's a murderer? And that justice and love for that little baby demands the execution of that young mom? I want you to take just a second, and I want you to gauge right now internally how you're feeling. Because some of you were amening and all that good stuff, and I get it. But you're adamant. You doggone right we ought to put them in there. <laughs> y'all are y'all ready to grab the pitchforks. Some of you may have been, you may not have been as loud about it, but some of you in here possibly, and I know it exists out there, but some of you may be sitting here and you may be adamant, just as adamant on the other side of that argument and say, we shouldn't be taking anyone's life. Some of you may be unsure. See, brothers and sisters, there are very, very strong emotions and feelings that are represented on both sides of that disagreement. But that's exactly the reason why our feelings and our emotions have no place in these matters. Especially when it comes to things like legislation and justice and punishment. You say, well, if it's not our feelings or our emotions, if it's not our reasoning and our, our mental faculties, what is it? What is the ultimate standard when it comes to dealing with things that involve loving our neighbors and ensuring that they're treated fairly and justly under the law? I would again submit to you that the only standard is the law of God found in the Old Testament. 
No other objective standard exists. Listen to what the psalmist writes in Psalm 2. Speaking of the reign and the rule of Jesus in the earth. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together and against the Lord and against his anointed, speaking of Jesus, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. What they're saying there is, yeah, we know Jesus has a law, but we're going we're gonna to count, take counsel together. We'll decide what is just. We don't, we don't want to look at the law of Jesus, the law of God. We're going to take counsel together. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna break the chains of Christ and his kingdom. And we're going to make our own rules and do things our own way. And as they're doing that, look at verse 4. It says, he who sits in the heavens sees all that and laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Guys, who's that talking about? Jesus You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. Now therefore, kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Kiss, or I'm sorry, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Son there is capitalized, speaking of Jesus. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. This passage is speaking about what the kings and the rulers of the earth are supposed to do when Jesus comes and takes over. Brothers and sisters, how much more clear could it be that Jesus has come and taken over than when he says, all power and all authority in heaven and on earth are mine. That pretty much nails it down, wouldn't you think? Listen again to the warning given to these earthly authorities. Now therefore, kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. Some of your translations may say, honor the sun or pay homage to the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Wait, Matt, perish? Don't that mean die? There's no death in heaven. Ding, ding, ding. This is not a heavenly reality. This is an earthly reality. Believe it or not, brothers and sisters, we're already halfway to Christmas. And before you know it, you're going to be seeing Isaiah 9, 6 all over the place, and I cannot wait. You can ask my wife. uh, I'm listening to Joy to the World and watching Elf about the same time Gamecock football kicks off. Christmas is like, that's my jam. I don't have this wrote down, but while we're on it, let's just go on ahead and hit it really quick. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Just kind of mark this, highlight it, come back and study it. Go through the whole chapter. Go to the chapter before, go to the chapter after. Study out this passage. It is glorious. Isaiah chapter 9. We're just going to hit verse 6 and verse 7. You can go back later and check it out. But I want you to see this really quick for yourself. And you're going to recognize this immediately. Isaiah 9, 6, here we go. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Can't you just smell the apple cinnamon in the eggnog right now? But wait, there's more. Look at the following verse, verse 7. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. You know, it kind of sounds like when Jesus told the disciples that the kingdom of God would grow like a mustard seed, doesn't it? To establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, and it's the zeal of the Lord that will accomplish this. To establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. Brothers and sisters, question, 
Did Christ enter the world like Isaiah prophesied? Yes, he did. Did Jesus say that all power and all authority in heaven and on earth are now his? Yes, he did. Does that mean that the government from that time forth is supposed to increase in the earth and the rulers and the judges are now supposed to submit to his kingship and obey his law? Yes, it does. Justice and righteousness. Again, how do we know what that looks like? The law of God in the Old Testament. Not if, but since Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. We say it all the time. Since that's true, not just out there somewhere, but here now. Since that's true, then by default, his decrees of what is just and what is righteous are non-negotiable. Guys, that's really what the Great Commission is all about. It's a proclamation of a global policy change. And our job as his ambassadors in the earth is to go out as heralds and declare what has been decreed from the sovereign. Y'all know what heralds are, right? See, back in the day when the king would issue a decree, the scribes would come and they they would write that decree out on a scroll and then they they would hand those scrolls off to heralds. And those heralds would take those scrolls out into the marketplace and go stand in and stand at the, uh, the city gates and they would find them a little soapbox or something to elevate themselves on. And they would unroll the scroll. And with all the confidence and with all the authority of the king that had sent them, they would project as loudly as they could to the townspeople. Thus says the king. That's the Great Commission in action. See, when we go and we appeal to the magistrates and the legislators to put forth bills that honor Christ as king, we aren't appealing to them to put in bills that came from the Republican platform. We don't go to them and say, hey, put these bills in because this is what the people of South Carolina want. We appeal to them with the word of God, the lordship of Christ, and the law of God. We appeal to them with passages like we just read Psalm 2. And Romans 13, where Paul, which has been butchered over the last couple of years, it makes me sick. Romans 13, where Paul says, remember God defined what government it is. And in Romans 13, he actually does that. What is the role of government? Romans 13, Paul says, your job is to establish justice reward good and punish evil guys listen to me when the government does anything outside of these, those three things you should not go along with it you should actively defy it establish justice reward good and punish evil it's what the apostles did in the book of acts it's what the reformers did 500 years ago It's what the Puritans did to usher in the Great great Awakening. And I am telling you now, if we ever want to see our nation fall back on its face before a holy God, we have got to get out of these pews, say what the prophets said, do what the prophets did, tell the world that Christ is king, be okay with being hated for it, and trust God with the results. Say, but Matt, that'll, that'll never work. We are too far gone. No one's ever going to listen to us. Best thing we can do is just hunker down, care for our own, and just let the world just decay into destruction. Aren't you glad the first century Christians didn't live that way? Aren't you glad that Martin Luther and the Reformers didn't live that way? Aren't you glad that John Huss didn't believe that when he was burned alive for merely attempting to translate the scriptures in English for you and I today? I used to think that way. I used to live that way. But I can tell you right now, I have seen firsthand, Kylie can tell you, we have seen firsthand, you wouldn't believe the stories of the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit out there 
I've seen legislators repent. I've seen organizational leaders, uh, uh, leaders repent. I've seen pastors. Kylie and I preached at a church in Georgia. The pastor fell under conviction and repented behind the pulpit to his congregation that night. What wasn't us, it was God. Don't hear me say what I'm not saying. We've seen these things. I've seen moms and dads change their mind about killing their baby. I've seen strip club bouncers quit on the job because they came under conviction of the Holy Spirit because we were preaching at those places. I've seen demon-possessed people shut their mouths and run away when the Word of God is proclaimed in the open air. I've seen it. Pastor Scott and Pastor Kenny, they'll tell you, even at the Southern Baptist Convention, there's something going on. The Lord's doing something. And it's because the church, slowly but surely, is starting to push back a little bit against this ancient evil that is here to kill, steal, and destroy. This brings me to my fourth and final point. We have the sovereign proclamation. Christ proclaiming that he has all power and all authority in the cosmos. We have the mission statement for the church, go make disciples of all the nations. We have our how-to manual, which is the law of God and the gospel. Which, by the way, to hammer this point home, let me say this. When I say the word gospel, hitting on that, that idea of being clear in what you mean and knowing what words mean and all these things, for the longest time, when I heard the word gospel, there was only one thing that came to my mind, salvation. Reconciliation between God and man. But that was it. That was what the gospel was. Why do we preach the gospel? So that men can be reconciled to God and entered into the family of God. That was it. And how do we preach the gospel? Well, we preach Christ crucified. Him, him buried and resurrected. And believing in him and trusting in him for your salvation, you can be promised resurrection as well in the last day. That was the gospel. But for me, that's where it ended. And maybe for you this morning, hearing this for the first time, that's where the gospel ends for you. But did you know that in Matthew 4.23, go check this out, write that down and go look at it. In Matthew 4.23, now remember, if the gospel has to have a cross, has to have a grave, and has to have a resurrection, if that's all you think of when you think the gospel, the Bible says in Matthew 4.23 that when Jesus comes on the scene, guess what he's going around preaching? The gospel. So if the gospel is all about a cross and all about a grave and all about a resurrection, it is about those things, but if it's only about those things, that had nothing to do with what the gospel Jesus was preaching in Matthew 4. He hadn't gone to the cross yet. He hadn't been to the grave yet. He hadn't come back from the dead yet. It says he preached the gospel of the kingdom. That's the part of the gospel that the church has been missing. It's the gospel that John the Baptist preached. It's the gospel the apostles preached. And it was part of the gospel that Jesus our Lord preached. He was saying, I'm here, this is mine. I'm taking over. Come quietly. That's the gospel of the kingdom. So we have the how-to manual, which is the law of God and his gospel. And we have the final part of the Great Commission where Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Y'all keep hearing me say it, and I'm going to say it again. As modern evangelicals, those words don't quite hit us the way that they hit the people that heard it for the very first time. But you know, many times when Jesus was speaking in the New Testament, he would quote a phrase or a verse from the Old Testament to draw the listener's attention back to the Old Testament. And he did that to prove and point out that he was the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. Y'all know what I'm talking about? As a matter of fact, scholars say that nearly 10% of Jesus' words either directly quoted or referenced the Old Testament. See, Jesus was a master at saying things without saying things. For instance, in John chapter 8, it's a, it's a cool passage. John chapter 8, Jesus is having this back and forth with the Jews. And Jesus tells the Jews, hey, even Abraham looked forward to my coming. 
are you talking about Jesus? Abraham? You're not even 50 years old yet. How do you know what Abraham looked forward to? You, you're crazy. You know what Jesus said? Before Abraham was, I am. See, what Jesus said without saying it was, I am God. And he used the Old Testament to make his point for him. Jesus was a gangster. Another one is when Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know that wasn't a question? He wasn't asking a question. What Jesus was doing was telling everyone around that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy that was written in Psalm 22. See, before the 1500s, the Bible didn't use chapters and verses like what we have today. Sections of the Bible were broken up into titles. That's why if you go look at Psalms, all the Psalms have a title. If you go look through, everything was kind of labeled in a title. And what we know today is Psalm 22. If I wanted back then to say, hey, turn to Psalm 22, I would say, hey, go find the scroll that is titled, Why Have You Forsaken Me? So when Jesus is on the cross and he says, why have you forsaken me? What he was doing, an, an Old Testament Jew, a first century Jew, would have knew exactly what Jesus was doing. He was saying, go read Psalm 22. Go read the title, why have you forsaken me? Read what's in that chapter. That's me. And they would have recognized exactly what was going on. So when Jesus tells them to go take over the world, basically, and then he caps that mandate with, I will be with you to the end, they would have picked up exactly what Jesus was putting down. I love this. This last sentence here probably gave them more boldness than any of the other three portions of the Great Commission. You know why? Because it's in this moment that the disciples realized exactly who Jesus was. King of kings, yep. Lord of lords, oh yeah. Our great high priest, yes. Our once and for all sacrifice, amen. Our strength in times of weakness, our comfort in times of grief, our hope in times of, cert of uncertainty, yes, yes, and amen. But when Jesus said, I will be with you, something else popped up in their mind. And they realized that Jesus was the angel of the Lord. I was hoping it would be quiet when I said that. Some of you that may be ringing some bells, some of you may not have a clue what's going on right now. But in case you didn't know, in the Old Testament when the angel of the Lord showed up, it was about to go down. See, it was the angel of the Lord that appeared to Gideon and told him to go wage war with 135,000 Midianites. And by the way, Gideon, I'm only letting you take 300 men with you. Gideon did it, and he won. You know how? The angel of the Lord was with him. It was the angel of the Lord that came to Joshua. said, Joshua... I want you to go, and I want you to take down the walls of Jericho. Not by force. Leave the catapults here. Leave the battering rams here. Grab some trumpets and some ram's horns. March around the city seven times and yell real loud. Impossible by all accounts. But it happened. You know why? Because the angel of the Lord was with Joshua how about this one the Assyrian army is marching towards Jerusalem just imagine this with 185,000 Assyrian soldiers they're coming to march uh, to, to just knock Jerusalem off the map the angel of the Lord shows up they wake up the next morning Every last one of them has been slaughtered in one night. Who did it? The angel of the Lord.
When the angel of the Lord was, said he was with you, regardless of what the other side looked like, they were immediately outnumbered. And now, ascending to the right hand of the Father to take his rightful place as king, having commissioned his followers to go and take over the world, he promises them that he, the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army, will be with them. How did a handful of teenage misfits and fishermen bring down the most powerful empire the world has ever seen? They walked by faith, and they trusted in the very one who was promised to be with you and I today. Brothers and sisters, I know that when you look out that window, when you go out these doors, when you check in on social media, when you watch the news, I know it looks hopeless. I know it looks helpless. And I'll readily admit to you that I still have concerns. I still make preparations. I think we're called to do that as men. We're called to be prepared and to protect and provide for our families and, and, and be you know, aware of our surroundings. But the question we need to ask ourselves is this. When we look out there and we see how wicked and evil it is, what has God, God called us to do about it? When we consider the Great Commission and what it meant to those first century believers who heard it first, when we remember the obstacles that they not only faced but overcome, when we read about the Reformation and the Great Awakening and we take inventory of where we are today, what gives us the right to think? that we don't have to pick up the sword and attack the dragons of our day like all of our brothers and sisters that have come before us. What if the only way that things are going to change out there comes by us being the faithful heralds again and taking God's decrees back out into the public square and into the highways and into the byways? Jesus addresses Peter regarding this in Matthew 16, 18. He said, Peter, this is it. I'm, 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 I'm getting out of here. I'm building my church right here on this rock. And he makes him a promise. He says, I'm giving her a mission. And here's the promise. If the church will go up against the gates of hell, the gates of hell will fall. Jesus isn't a liar. History has proven that when the church decides to engage and fight with the confidence and the authority of the king of glory with the gospel of his kingdom and the gospel of reconciliation, the gates of hell always come down. Is it dark out there right now? It is. It's, it's, it's real dark. Come hang out with us one Friday night. You'll see just how dark. But you know, the interesting thing about darkness, brothers and sisters, it's not actually a thing. You can't hold darkness. You can't contain it. You can't project it. Darkness is merely the absence of light. And it doesn't take much light to dispel it. Are you being faithful to the great commission our king has given you? Or do you need to repent of being so wrapped up in building your own kingdom that you forget that you're supposed to be building his? It could look a lot different out there, brothers and sisters. But the only hope that we have in seeing that happen is by taking the promises and the gifts that we've been given and putting them to action. If you want to know how to do that, go talk to Kenny. He's doing it. And the last thing I'll say is this. The Great Commission its not the Great Suggestion. It's not the great recommendation. We have a sovereign king. We have his word. We have our marching orders. And we have the angel of the Lord with us everywhere we go. Let that be an encouragement to you. But let that also be a warning. Because the Bible is clear that one day we're going to stand before the Lord of glory and we're going to give an account. And with all these gifts that I've just mentioned that he's given us, his word, the angel of the Lord... His promise. Brothers and sisters, we are without excuse. Live your life 
in a way that honors your king. Be faithful to the great commission. Fight the good fight. And long more than anything else in this world to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this is poked. I pray that it's prodded. I pray that it's encouraged. God, I don't don't know the hearts of the people that are here. I love this church. I know that many of them support us. And Lord, there's many that are going. But Lord, maybe, maybe there's some here that, Lord, this has just kind of hit them and it's put a bad taste in their mouth and say, wow, you're calling us to be, you know, that, that doesn't sound loving. It doesn't sound nice. But God, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit and, the, and your word that you've given us, God, that you will, you will speak to those hearts, God. Lord, help them to take off the lenses that they've possibly been seeing the scriptures through of a watered-down version of what it means to be faithful to the Great Commission. God, there's a reason why Paul used military terms like put on the armor of God. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12 that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against evil spirits in the spiritual darkness. God, this is war. They're coming for our homes. They're coming for our children. They're coming for truth. God, the only restraint that you've put into this world, the only salt, the only light that you have put into this world is your church. The Republican, the Republican uh, platform can't save us. Trump can't save us. DeSantis can't save us. Lord, it's your gospel that's going to change hearts. But God, it's going to be your church that administers that gospel to a lost and dying world. So God, would you speak to hearts this morning? I pray that, Lord, this has been edifying. But Lord, more than anything, I pray that you've been glorified and honored. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. If the Holy Spirit has convicted you in any way this morning, the altar is open and allow you to come and seek the Lord. You come this morning.
God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Just a couple of announcements as we uh, leave today. Uh, there is a, a homeschool uh, meeting with parents. It's going to be Friday, June the 30th. If you uh, would ever consider about homeschooling or would like more information, please come and be a part of that. It's going to be in the back in the coffee shop. Um, vacation Bible School is right around the corner. And uh, if you have not signed up, I think there's still a few spots open. Make sure that you do that. Um, and then next Sunday, July the 2nd, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to move out of this place, and we're going back to the gym. And uh, it's going to be just a, a great service, 4th of July, celebrating July the 2nd. And it's going to be a great time together. We're going to have hamburgers, hot dogs. You bring the drinks and desserts. And we're just going to fellowship. We're going to have a great time. Scott will be back preaching. But here's one thing that I need to know. And we're going to do this very quickly. Just to get an idea of how much food to prepare. If you are planning on coming and you would uh, stay with us and fellowship together immediately after the service would you just raise your hand and I've got counters you guys count right quick just raise your hands that would just give me an idea of how much to um, prepare for okay keep them up keep your hands up lift them up so we can see we got counters and as they're doing that thank you so much uh, we're just about there all right. Thank you for doing that so much. Senior lunch. Uh, make sure that you read the bulletin July the 13th. There will be a meeting. And then uh, <clears throat> there will be next week no life university. One service, 1030. Just come at 1030. And uh, one worship service. Uh, and then we'll start back with a new life university uh, the following the following Sunday, so no life university f until two weeks. Okay, does that make sense? All right, thank you, Matt. Good job, good job. It's the word of God, man. We got to stand on truth. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Father. Uh, thank you for today. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord and worship together as our family help us lord through the message today that we would stand on the word of god with no compromise and we'll do whatever it takes father help us to get involved to uphold righteousness and stand against wickedness and to say to others Thus says the king. We bless you. Go with us as we go into the world to share the greatest news of all the world. Jesus saves. With that, Father, go with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.